shifting gears again. Johanna, we're surrounded by Germans. So we, <laughs> are, we, we, we are. are. We are. So we have to stick together. I guess. We, we were perfectly happy in our world of rectal cancer, yeah. where we were doing surgeries on patients and then post-op deciding whether or not to give chemo and radiation based on real pathology. We then had this German study, that we call it, um, that actually compared pre-op versus post-op chemo RT. And while there was no overall survival benefit, a very important point, there was, an there was a, a, a toxicity benefit, primary anastomose, very important endpoints, but it made us shift to a world where we were giving essentially everybody with a whisper of erectile cancer, neoadjuvant chemo and radiation. And I think now we're starting to see the pendulum swing back a little bit. Tell me about sort of a, your typical rectal cancer patient. How are you evaluating them? Is everybody getting chemo radiation? Um, is that the, still the standard? Right, so I think within the United States, for the most part, we're still looking at neoadjuvant chemo radiation therapy as the standard of care. And when we do our preoperative evaluation, we want to look at endoscopic ultrasound or MRI, endorectocoil MRI, to try to get the best sense of what the stage is of the tumor. But in the end, one of the questions that's starting to emerge now is now that we're giving everybody preoperative chemoradiation therapy, are we over-treating our patients? Are we treating patients that they come out N0 after they've received preoperative chemoradiation therapy? Did they not have lymph nodes to begin with and may not have needed adjuvant chemotherapy afterwards? Or did we downstage them pathologically? Most likely. And yeah, most likely we have. But for patients who we initially stage by our radiologic methods as T3N0, should we be considering whether or not we take them right to the operating room first and avoid the neoadjuvant chemoradiation therapy? Now, there was an interesting look at patients with T3N0 tumors, and when you looked at pathologic specimens, you found that indeed about 20% of them had lymph node disease, mm. even despite our best efforts to discover it ahead of time. So I think. The other issue is if it's a high rectal tumor, do they need chemo radiation therapy at all, right? Because one of the reasons we use radiation therapy is because the high risk of, rec of local recurrence, and that's just because trying to get into that deep pelvis and get good clean margins is a little bit more difficult. But if it's high up and it's an easier surgery, and now I'm not a surgeon to be able to say that, could we potentially cure these patients without needing radiation therapy? So I think a lot of questions mm -hmm. are starting to emerge about that. But for right now, the standard still remains the neoadjuvant chemoradiation therapy, but I think we still have to very much consider what we're doing here. And then give us an idea of how you're managing rectal cancers at home in Germany. Well, usually we do, uh, we do administer neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. One reason is what has been mentioned, we have um, a lower recurrence rate, and we have a lower rate of colostomies. That's another very important issue for the patient. And the third argument is um, the, the, the neoadjuvant treatment is better tolerated than the postoperative uh, uh, radiotherapies. This, I think this is what we have to keep in mind. Because sometimes we have discussions, you know, an elderly patient says, oh, we don't want to give uh, a neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, and then postoperatively it turns out that he actually would need adjuvant chemoradiotherapy. And then the issue is coming up again, shall this elderly patient treat it with, uh, with toxic uh, chemotherapy? So most of the patients are now treated with neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy. Now I have a very... Um, would say aggressive or very good uh, rectal surgeon in my department and uh, patients who are treated is, uh, in his operating theater he believes that the, the local recurrence is so low that <laughs> radiotherapy you don't is, well, that you don't need radiation yeah. therapy. Yeah. Surgeons are feeling this yeah. way that if they get a good specimen a nice glistening yeah. specimen as they call them that teaming. they don't need it. Exactly and I think they are right in a way because it, you know the surgeons have, have been tremendously learned from all the, the recent data that it is so important to do a good operation here and by this we, re we lower the rate of, of local recurrence. However, the Dutch have t shown us that even with the best operation, TME operation, you even lower the local recurrence rate by giving radiotherapy in addition to that. So, so this is why we still stick to most of the patients who have combined chemo, chemo radiotherapy. So my problem with this in many ways is that radiation really has long, can have significant long-term consequences, proctitis, cystitis, a bone marrow uh, insult. You can't then go back and operate very well on these patients if you need to. So what about maybe a chemo-only approach? Axel. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so the data that uh, Henning mentioned uh, about local recurrence, re reducing risk of local recurrence in the, with adequate and good surgery only applies to the lower rectum, mid 
lower rectum. So I think the easiest target population now to investigate exactly your question, do we really need radiation therapy with all these long-term sequelae? Uh, is the patient population with mid to higher rectum cancer? Location, location, location really matters. And uh, the, uh, so there is actually an ongoing trial. We have a trial in the United States about uh, the usefulness or the, the of a new adjuvant chemotherapy alone. We shouldn't forget, you know, chemotherapy actually works on the primary tumor. There are good data uh, from a Mirosome catering that actually sparked this randomized phase two slash three trial right now, which is an intergroup trial that showed, you know, when you give folfox based chemotherapy, folfox plus bevacizumab without bevacizumab, um, without radiation in rectal cancer, comp pathologic complete response rate was about 20 to 30%. I mean, I try to be conservative. They actually have more than 30%, but I would guesstimate it's probably around 20 to 30%, which is more or less in line with what we see with neoadjuvant chemo, radio chemotherapy. So I can easily envision that down the line, you know, once we've been more comfortable doing this, uh, using this approach, we could have chemotherapy alone, especially for the mid to higher rectal tumors, which do not uh, have such a surgical challenge. You know, sort of a magic the, approach. The magic the approach, yeah. Right. But I do believe, you know, neoadrenaline and radio chemotherapy will remain the kind of the hallmark of the lower rectal cancers because even if it doesn't influence overall survival, as we heard, the morbidity of a patient with a pelvic tumor recurrence is just tremendously bad. Yeah. Heinz, one more sort of rectal question, if we could. We're seeing more and more, particularly lower down rectal tumors, T1, T2s, yeah. where surgeons are now doing transanal approaches, mm. clean margins, and then sending them to us and saying, what should I do? Yeah. Patients want to save their tail. They don't want an ostomy. And so it's quite a, uh, a vulnerable population in many ways to cutting corners. What's the USC approach to these low down, early stage, early T1, T2 lesions? Yeah. So I, I think this is a wonderful example that rectal cancer needs to be discussed in a multidisciplinary environment because here you have the radiation oncologist, the surgeons and the oncologist. And we heard of all the data on the systemic chemotherapy, how successful it is. And the transdental excision get, get, seems to get more and more fashionable everywhere. And then we get the patients to see with a T2 or T3 lesion, which looked like a T2 on tr transrectal ultrasound and MRI. And then do we need to go back? Do we, net, do, do we need chemo radiation because the lymph nodes? I, I think it's a big challenge. I, I think I have a hard time to discuss should we do chemo radiation uh, in this patient population. So I think what we need to do in this patient is to discuss it before the surgery. So we are trying to attempt that and really discuss the best approach because I think sometimes we are surprised about the pathology coming back for very easy early and then we don't know what the best really treatment is. I mean, I quote a patient of maybe as high as 10%, even with a T1 of node positivity oh, yes. based on the yes. evidence. So I feel uncomfortable yes. not very treating those but patients. Do you all feel the same? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very nerve wracking mm. thinking about, you've taken out the primary, now you haven't done the proper cancer surgery and you worry about those nodes that have been Of course, but you know, then you treat, knowing that you may treat 90% for nothing. Right. Yeah, so it, this is a big, right. big dilemma for the patients and the physicians. Well, there's even more challenge because we have uh, gastroenterologists doing the mucosal risk sections uh, as we have learned from the Japanese and in my department we have somebody who's really very very skilled in that so we are very f often faced with this discussion yeah uh, endoscopically or uh, on ultrasound you know this was a T1 lesion yeah and then we see it's a G1 lesion taken out by mucosectomy and we often very often tend to leave it like this and follow the patient closely